Welcome to the From the Experts, All Things Celiac. Today's webinar is Advancing Celiac Research Through Patient Participation and Industry Partnership, hosted by the National Celiac Association and the Harvard Medical School Celiac Research Program. The Harvard Medical School Research Program, Celiac Research Program, was founded in 2013 by celiac experts from three Boston hospitals. Dr. Alan Leichner of Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Kieran Kelly of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and Dr. Alessio Fasano of Massachusetts General Hospital. The highly collaborative Harvard Medical School program has a twofold mission of developing and promoting the latest research in celiac disease and advancing awareness about celiac disease through educational programs to clinicians and the general public. I'm Lee Graham, Executive Director of the National Celiac Association, serving the gluten-free community since 1993. National Celiac provides educational resources on our website like Ask the Dietitian, Raising Our Celiac Kids, and Supporting Celiac Seniors. Zoom interactive meetings are open to all on the second Tuesday of every month. And my thanks to all of you who have supported our food insecurity initiative called Feeding Gluten-Free. Together, we have given over $1.2 million worth of gluten-free food to food pantries in over 3,000 communities. For today, you are welcome to ask general questions through the Q&A feature, which is located on the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. Closed, cap closed caption is available by clicking the CC button. And for those of you who have registered for continuing education units, please fill out the survey that was added to the chat box and it'll be, do doing, um, it'll be added during the webinar. If you're still struggling, connect with us. Tech support is available as needed at digitalmedia@partners.org, or by phone, 857-282-6470. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on National Celiac's website, nationalceliac.org. Our moderator today is Dr. Alessio Fasano. Dr. Fasano is the W. Allen Walker Chair of Pediatric Gastroenterology. He is the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition and Director of the Mucosal Immunology and Biology Research Center, all at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He is also Professor of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on several areas in intestinal mucosal biology and immunology, including how bacteria causes disease through the composition and function of the gut microbiome in health and disease, and the regulation of gut permeability and the mechan mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2. As director of the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children, Dr. Fasano is widely sought after as an expert in celiac disease, intestinal permeability, and autoimmune disorders. Welcome, Dr. Fasano. Oh, I just have to add one more thing. He is also the author of Gluten Freedom and the co-author of Gut Feelings, The Microbiome and Our Health, published in 2021 by the MIT Press. Welcome, Dr. Fasano. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you to NCA to partner with uh, um, our Harvard uh, Celiac Research Program uh, for this um, uh, webinar series. Uh, today is um, the first uh, uh, of the new series, uh, and this is a very hot topic, advances celiac research through patients' participation industry partnership. Uh, we have a parterre of speakers that are phenomenal and highly qualified to cover um, this topic. I want just to remind again, as Lee mentioned, that we will entertain question and answer that you can submit to the Q&A feature uh, in, um, you see in your screen down on the right, and please maintain, keep this uh, question as, as general as, as possible. And let me start introducing our first speaker. Actually, uh, you know, Dan Leffler doesn't need any introduction. He's one of the pillars of the CEDEC world uh, in the United States and worldwide. 
his contribution is undisputable in moving uh, this field forward. And besides to be an excellent, uh, you know, clinician and investigator, is a good friend. So I'm a little bit biased in presenting him. Um, he is a, um, a, a practicing gastroenterologist uh, that is focusing uh, his care of gluten-related disorders, including celiac disease and other gastrointestinal disorders. He was uh, one of the two founding members of the Cedar Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He's associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and um, his career has been, you know, uh, long and, and, and successful with several grants that he received from uh, the NIH, his foundation, and industry members supporting the research. Um, he uh, authored, co-authored more than 150 articles. Uh, and again, you know, his contribution to advance our knowledge of celiac disease and gluten related disorders is very clear to everybody that has a minimal interest in the field. Um, together with Melinda Dennis, uh, he wrote uh, to the uh, book, uh, Real Life with Celiac Disease, Troubleshooting and Driving Gluten-Free. And since 2016, he joined uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals. So he's definitely, uh, as senior medical director, a global clinical leader for the celiac disease in the gastrointestinal therapeutic area, Takeda, he's extremely qualified to be today and talk about, you know, the, this topic uh, that we'll cover today. So Dan, without first ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alessio, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the NCA for hosting. Um, I, you know, these conferences are really of such great value for all of us to learn uh, together as a community. So I believe we're actually going to start with a few uh, questions uh, from uh, poll questions for the audience. So if we want to bring those up. Um, we can go ahead and start. So this one's a quick one. It shouldn't take a whole lot of time to answer. And I'm going to try to run through these polls pretty quickly because we've got a lot of great content to cover. So have you ever participated in celiac disease research? Yes, no, or no, but I want to. Um, and we'll give you just you know 10 or 15 seconds uh, and we can see what people's responses are. All right, I think that's plenty of time for this simple question. I wanna pull up those answers. Okay. Great, so this I think mirrors what we largely see is that there are a, a minority of people who actually participate in celiac disease research, although you know, likely if you're on this call, you believe that there is great value in celiac research. And there's another portion who know but wants to and, and, and a larger percentage of the population. And this is true for any disease. I don't want to celiac, then go out celiac disease, um, where just research is sort of for whatever reason, um, not high on uh, the personal agenda. So let's go to the next question. We can try to dig into this a little bit more. So for those, I guess for all of you, but especially the people who, who said no or no, but they want to, you know, what keeps you from participating in celiac research? And again, um, we'll give you a few seconds to run through this. Uh, this is one where you can check as many as you want because there's often more than one. Uh, reason. So worried about potential side effects. You don't have biopsy confirmed celiac disease or not sure if you can participate. You're not sure where to learn about studies. Um, you're worried about taking a new drug for these types of research that are drug studies. Uh, time constraints. Everyone's got a busy life these days. Um, you've never been approached for research. Um, there are some studies that, talk, that uh, require eating some degree of gluten and there's concerns about those. Um, distance, the travel costs, or, or other things. And I, I know we haven't covered everything, but we did try to be fairly inclusive with a list of some of the things we hear most as investigators uh, when we are talking to people about potential research. So again, we'll give you just a few more seconds um, and we can pull up those responses. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that now. Okay. So this is great. This is the interesting. Um, and again, I, I don't think terribly surprising. There is no single thing that, that I've ever found in my career has, that keeps people from doing research. It is a spectrum of, of legitimate concerns. And, and for many people, it's more than one thing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hard to even know, but, I, you know, I think if I was going to take one message away is that this this reminds us as investigators that we really need to individualize the way we talk about research with people because everyone's got different concerns and issues. Um, 
and also we have to provide a lot of this information up front. Uh, but also on, on the patient side, you know, we recognize this as investigators. So never, never be hesitant to say like, hey, I'd love to participate, but I'm worried about the gas costs or the distance. Like, is there anything you can do as an investigator to help me? Because often there is ways we can compensate or reimburse. So with that, thank you. I'm going to close the poll. That was informative. Um, and we will start off with my presentation. Just get that going. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about emerging developments in CLTs. Again, focus on this concept of um, partnering with industry, high disclosures, uh, which were largely already mentioned. So I'm going to really hit on two large topics, immune tolerance, um, how to uh, and, and can celiac disease be the, the key to curing autoimmunity? Um, and the second biomarkers, new tests that are coming to the clinic, um, driven by research, largely industry-sponsored research. So with that, let's go on to immune tolerance. So as, as many of you may know, there are is a lot of active effort in trying to develop new therapies for celiac disease. This is a really exciting area, and we could spend all, all the whole hour just talking about this one slide. I think there's a lot of... Um, promising agents across almost all of these boxes, but we're gonna be focusing on this one at the bottom in red, promoting immune tolerance. So what does that actually mean? It means turning off that reaction against gluten um, while leaving the rest of the immune system intact. This is something that people have been trying to do and talking about in across immune diseases for decades. Um, and, but I think we're finally seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel on potential ways that we might do this. So first, you know, this audience, again, I don't think we need to go into this in depth. Clearly autoimmune diseases and celiac disease among them is a huge burden. It's the highest single cause of morbidity in women. It's the top, one of the top five causes of mortality in women. Autoimmune, most autoimmune diseases are more common in women. And it's the top three highest cost to the healthcare system right after cancer and cardiovascular disease. So the burden of immune diseases in general and celiac disease is a classic one is incredibly high and really, you know, a, a, a huge public health issue that we need to begin to address. So the other side of this, and, and this is a very complicated side that I'm just going to say one quick thing about, and that is that there are many, many different companies, there's different academic researchers working on platforms and methods to try to, call, to, try to reverse autoimmune diseases, to try to turn off that immune reaction. Again, no one is born with an autoimmune disease. You develop it later in life, just like COC. So if you develop it, you should be able to turn it off and convince the immune system, no, no, don't worry about gluten. It's really not a problem, but leave the rest of the immune system uh, alone and, and fully functional. And that in a nutshell is, is the goal of antigen specific, protein specific tolerization. So why celiac disease? Um, and I'll just walk you through um, a little bit of a pathway that I think shows why there's so much excitement, not only in celiac disease, but across the autoimmune field and, and working with celiac disease to try to um, solve this problem of autoimmune conditions in general. So what do you need um, to, to test one of these therapies and to try to see if you, whatever you're working on in the lab will work in an autoimmune disease? Well, first of all, you need to have an autoimmune disease. There's lots of these. Um, you also need to know what the antigen or protein that the immune system attacks. So in celiac disease, obviously we know it's gluten. We know this in some diseases, but we actually don't know it in a lot of others. You need to really have, have be able to well characterize that antigen. Um, and again, you cut down this, this circle a little smaller. It needs to be reversible. You know, so for something like thyroid disease, if you've already destroyed the, the hormone making glands in your thyroid, even if you reverse the autoimmunity, it's not clear what you can do. So there's only a few diseases like celiac disease where the body can heal theoretically, once you control autoimmunity. And finally, we need responsive biomarkers, tests that we can easily use in the clinic to see if somebody's responding or not. And really celiac disease stands out as a really unique disease where you can check all of these boxes and hopefully be a platform for developing immune therapies that'll work in many diseases. And celiac disease, although it's a responsibility, I think of the celiac community um, to be the first, it's also potentially the benefit because this, th this community could be the first to benefit from, um, from effective therapies like these. So the other thing to know is that we already know that there's different levels of tolerance in, in celiac disease. And this is uh, work that we did together with Alessio's group, uh, a gluten challenge study, Jocelyn's group, Alessio's group all together, um, where we took 
people with celiac disease and did a gluten challenge to really better define the biology and the types of tests we can use to better understand immune activation in celiac disease. And so just quickly, some people, not surprisingly, because we see this in every study, some people with clear biopsy proven celiac disease can go on this gluten challenge, they feel fine. And really by the end of the challenge, this was a two week challenge, they're really still feeling fine and their intestine actually still looks okay. Other people, on the other hand, get really have significant symptoms within the first couple hours. And, and we know, we understand this much better. I'll come to that a little bit later in the talk. Um, they have different cells that come up and their intestine can have significant damage by the end of two weeks. I'll come back to that again uh, as well at the end of the talk, because um, it, it actually recovers and we have good data for that. So you don't necessarily need to cure celiac disease to make a difference in, by, in immune tolerization. You, if you can turn the person in the bottom into the person in the top, you've dramatically uh, impre increased their ability to control their disease, to not be limited and not honestly be, be stuck in the bathroom and, and really ill every time they get accidentally gluten. So there, there is, I think, a path that's in between cure to partial tolerization that can really be highly beneficial in celiac disease. So I am working on one, it's my job at Takeda, working on one uh, asset for one drug that potentially can do this. And I'll just show you some, a little bit of really high level stuff about this therapy. We actually have recently started a new trial um, in the United States and Canada for TAC-101, um, following up on these results. But, but TAC-101 is basically a IV nanoparticle, so a little ball. The ball is made up of something called PGLA. This is the same stuff that's in absorbable sutures. Um, so been around for a long time. And in this case, it's filled with gliadin, the same stuff you would eat accidentally um, if you have celiac disease. Um, and the, the idea, and this, this was research that came out of a lab at Northwestern, is that by packaging the gliadin very specially and delivering it intravenously, instead of activating celiac disease as happens when you eat gluten, you actually can convince the immune system to turn off that reaction because it's seeing the gliadin in a different place, in a place it's not expecting to see a foreign protein, in a place it's only expecting to see a protein from your own body. And you see proteins from your own body in, all the time, and most of the time, unless you have an autoimmune disease, your immune system does not react. So that's sort of the general theory for how this uh, uh, is supposed to work. So this is a study that was published last, uh, last year in gastroenterology. It's open access online if you would like to read further. Um, just skip through all this. But basically it was a, a medium-sized study, 34 people with biopsy-proven celiac disease, who agreed to take TAC 101 or placebo and undergo a gluten challenge for two weeks. This is um, becoming one of the standard ways to do this um, with both a variety of blood tests and, bi and intestinal biopsy at the during and at the end of the challenge to see if the drug was um, able to prevent the immune system activation that happens with gluten exposure. And there are tons and tons of data but I'm just gonna keep this at the highest size level for, for this talk. Um, this trial did meet its primary and multiple secondary endpoints. And this, these graphs on the left, this was looking at the gluten specific T cells, the T cells that run around in your blood after somebody gets exposed to gluten and whether that happened on TACL 101 compared to placebo. And what you see in the gray boxes is that with gluten exposure and placebo, you get a lot more of these inflammatory blood cells reacting to the gluten in your blood, but that was prevented with TAC 101. And in the graph on the right, which is the pink and blue, you, this was a non-specific stimuli, again, that was, that was done in vitro, showing that to other proteins, the things beyond gliadin, you get the exact same response on placebo or TAC 101. So TAC 101 does not suppress the immune system. It's not like steroids or something like that. It only, as far as we can tell, appears to work on gliadin and turn off that reaction. So I'm not gonna show you other data, but we also did look at the intestinal biopsies and the villus damage was also reduced with TAC-101 compared to placebo. So placebo patients did have some, uh, some increased damage to their villi with gluten exposure, as you would expect, this was not seen largely with TAC-101. So um, to be well-rounded, I also wanna present the safety. It was generally well-tolerated. Um, there, um, with as with many infusions, there were some mild uh, infusion reactions, but most uh, side effects were actually due to the gluten um, and it, a little bit more in the placebo arm, although this was not statistically significant, but a lot of GI symptoms. So as 
I noted we are, there's a study ongoing right now, recently started um, looking at this again and trying to understand um, different doses of TAC 101. Dose ranging is always a key part of understanding how a therapy can be used, but also understand how long this lasts. When we test TAC 101 in mouse models, it actually can last well, almost the life of the mouse. So we're seeing how long and we expect this to hopefully uh, this uh, last at least six months. So something to, to look towards. So going on to the next part of my talk, uh, moving rapidly, um, biomarkers approaching the clinic. And this, I want to start with refuting a myth. And that's one that, you know, if you do a study and the drug doesn't work, you've sort of wasted your time and it was all for nothing. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I think a great example of this is another immune tolerizing therapy that unfortunately was not successful in the clinic. Um, this was Nexfax2, a uh, therapy that used gluten peptides and, and it gave subcutaneous injections. Uh, to see if that could tolerize. It did not tolerize, but we learned really, really critical information that is changing the way we think about celiac disease um, and changing in the future the way we'll we'll, uh, we will assess celiac disease in practice. And so what they saw in this study was that surprisingly, when you gave an injection of gluten under the skin in the arm, people felt just like they ate gluten. They got abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea. No one expected this. Um, and even though that didn't bode well for the therapy, when they followed this up, they found this is that they elevate that there was elevated cytokines, especially IL-2. Um, these are inflammatory markers in the blood within a few hours after gluten exposure. And it may surprise you that we never really understood why people get symptoms so quickly after gluten exposure and celiac disease. And we know it takes weeks for the intestine to damage. We know it takes weeks for something like your serologies, the TTG blood test to be elevated. So we never really understood how people got symptoms so fast. This provided that huge missing link showing that people with celiac disease, when they get exposed to gluten very quickly, within an hour or two, have lots of cytokines running around their blood. People without celiac disease do not. Um, and because of this, we're actually starting to change how we practice in the clinic. So this is uh, the current standard of care for celiac disease for people for trying to understand if people have celiac disease when they're already on a gluten-free diet when they get to us. It's never what we like to see. We like to test before they are uh, go on a gluten-free diet. But right now we have to do HLA typing and a gluten challenge for a number of weeks and a follow-up biopsy. Um, coming to the clinic to the near future because of this industry-sponsored research for a, a failed, in quote, drug study, we actually are going to be using IL-2, I think. And, and um, again, in the this is not yet in the guidelines, but I expect it to be soon, where you'll just need a single dose, a single day dose amount of gluten challenge, and then an IL-2 blood test. So gone will be these days of two month long gluten challenges for most people to understand whether they have celiac disease or not. So I think this is an exciting development that again would not have come if people had not participated in a drug trial that in the end did not turn out to be a drug that continued in development. Um, and I just wanna give one more test that's coming that's being, that is part of ongoing research and academic industry collaborations. This is on video capsule endoscopy. This is, if you're not familiar with these, these are pills that you swallow and they take pictures all down your intestine. Um, they were developed initially for bleeding, um, but I think they can be very useful for celiac disease. And I'm gonna move through this at a fast pace as I have been this whole time. But one of the problems with celiac disease is we really only see the very beginning of the small intestine when we biopsy the small, when we take biopsies, but we know that celiac disease can affect a large portion of the small intestine. And so we haven't really had an easy technology to assess whole intestinal disease in celiac disease. And that's been a gap. We haven't, video capsule endoscopy has been talked about for this purpose, but it's been limited because it's hard to read. People use all sorts of different words when they talk about changes on video capsule endoscopy. So what we were able to do, and, and you can see a lot of collaborators there on the right from Mayo Clinic in Columbia and Sheffield and Milan and Harvard, um, we were able to develop a scale for using video capsule endoscopy in celiac disease to understand the amount and extent of disease. And at the top, that's a forest, it's not an intestine. At the bottom, it's an intestine. Um, but the reason we have the forest is that this, this technology actually allowed us to use pre-existing well-established geomapping software. The same things that's used to assess the amount in this picture of forest damage in the Amazon rainforest to understand the villus damage across the small intestine. And so that looks like this um, in real life. Here are eight people with celiac disease. And you can see um, that the 
the higher up that, that pink goes, the more damage there is in any one spot. The further it goes to the right, the more damage there is distal in the intestine. You can see how different people are with celiac disease. So even if they look the same on those intestinal biopsies, they can be very different in the amount of disease in the overall small intestine. So this is uh, just another thing that again, would not be existing. We're testing this in another uh, clinical trial, a TACO 62 trial that is also starting up uh, in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Um, and is, I, I think, really exciting as a new way and potentially a less burdensome way to assess the degree of intestinal damage and celiac disease. Um, and going back to that gluten challenge study um, that, we, that we did with Alessio's group and, and Jocelyn's group at Mass General and Beth Israel, here's one of those patients with that video capsule endoscopy where they had no damage. They got a little bit of moderate amount of damage on day 14, but by day 42 on video capsule endoscopy, it was almost back to normal. So I think this provides some nice reassuring information that even when there's intestinal damage with gluten challenge, it actually resolves fairly quickly. And that's consistent with what we see clinically anyway. So I'm gonna wrap up here with my conclusion um, is that, uh, you know, no surprise to this group, the incidence of immune disorders is high already and continues to increase in the cost to individuals, to their families and to the healthcare systems is really enormous. Um, a number of autoimmune and immune mediated diseases potentially we can address with antigen specific immunotherapy, but um, there are very few diseases that are as amenable to testing this as celiac disease is. Um, and, you know, there are many, there are many other, there are many different programs out there in, uh, in immune therapies. There's only a few that are in the clinic. Most of them are in still pretty clinical models. TAC 101 is the one that I'm working on personally. This is a novel non-immunosuppressive agent designed again to develop, to induce immune tolerance to gliadin in people with celiac disease. Um, but more generally, um, I think just a reminder and, and hopefully an encouraging note that participating in clinical trials, the drug trials or others, not only can lead to new potential treatments for CDCs, but also to really important new scientific understandings, which can improve the way we take care of people, even if they never take a drug, if they never participate in a trial. Um, there is, you know, the, all the advances um, that I've seen over my career, at least, have been because of the willingness of people to actually volunteer for research studies. Um, and, you know, I think that is why we, you know, there's a lot of excitement in CDCs right now, and I think why we in the field remain confident that there's a brighter future uh, for people with celiac disease moving forward. So with that, I, I will close up. I'm not sure if I went over time, but hopefully not too much if I did. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, Dan. No, just on time, maybe one minute, but that's, that, that's tolerable. Thank you for the clarity <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, 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 the clear, you know, um, how line of what, you know, uh, is in the pipeline and what is it entails to be part of, of this clinical trial. We're going to move on uh, to another, you know, icon in the field of CD disease. Uh, Francisco Leon uh, is, a, is a friend and, and a colleague extremely dedicated uh, to the CD disease cause. He um, took a different path compared to Dan in terms of career development. He was, he's a co-founder of several you know, companies, uh, including Prevention Bio, Cell Immune, and Glutenostics, uh, that are companies that are focused on development and commercialization of uh, drugs and diagnostic and preventive approach uh, for people with CD disease and other immunological disorders. He has a tremendous experience in translational immunology, both in academia when he was at the NIH and in biotech uh, like um, Abbott Therapeutics and Medimmune and big pharma like Bristol Myers Squibb, Johnson & Johnson, to name a few, before becoming an, an entrepreneur. But, but most importantly, being a clinical immunologist, um, an MD, PhD, uh, and his PhD was in celiac disease, he is really a strong advocate on um, the CD disease uh, world and, and again, his contribution to understand better, you know, the basic elements of immunology of CD disease and therefore what could do with that is it, definitely instrumental to move the field forward. So Francisco, again, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alessio. That was um, extremely kind of you. I can say that I wouldn't be here without the work that you and your team did 
over the years, uh, when you demonstrated the prevalence of celiac disease in the US was similar to that in Europe, that was really essential. And then later your work in tight junctions was very important for me to become an entrepreneur in, in celiac disease. So thank you. Thank you also to the rest of the team at the Harvard Medical School Celiac Research Program and the National Celiac Association. You have one of the best celiac teams in the world. Thank you for the invitation, Melinda. So I'm going to um, talk today about experimental approaches for the treatment of non-responsive celiac disease. My presentation complements the presentation by Dr. Leffler, who um, I am really honored to follow. It's a tough act to follow because Dan is such an incredible clinician and drug developer. By way of disclosures, I, I am the Chief Scientific Officer of Prevention Bio. And as Alessio mentioned, I have been involved in a number of companies like Cell Immune, Alba, Biomedal and Glutenostics, all companies are dedicated to trying to help people with celiac disease. Um, this is just a, a one slide about prevention, just to let you know what we are doing. Prevention is a company that specializes in trying to intercept autoimmune disease early in the disease process. It's now possible to identify people with high risk for autoimmunity by looking at genetic markers and early autoimmune markers such as autoantibodies in order to try to attempt primary prevention with vaccines or interception once the autoimmune phenomena have occurred. Prevention has several products in development under investigation for the prevention and interception of autoimmunity, and in particular, celiac disease. One of those products is a vaccine for a viral infection by a virus called Coxsackie B. Coxsackie virus B is a very common virus that causes meningitis, uh, hand, foot, mouth disease, encephalitis, myocarditis, it's a very common infection, millions of cases every year in the US, thousands of hospitalizations. And one of the most detrimental consequences of this infection is that this virus appears to be able to trigger autoimmunity, in particular type one diabetes and celiac disease. As you know, these are two closely linked autoimmune disorders with similar genetic predisposition. And it so happens that also similar association to Coxsackie B virus. The Teddy study, the environmental determinants of diabetes in the young, tried to understand environmental factors that lead to celiac and T1D, type 1 diabetes. And the only viral infection that showed an association, significant association between chronic infection and autoimmune disease was Coxsackie B. And interestingly, there is a uh, second factor when people infected by Coxsackie B during their childhood consumed high level of gluten, they had a very high risk of developing celiac disease. So you, it's a, it's a one-two punch in the development of celiac, you need to have on a genetic background that predisposes to autoimmunity, you would need to have an infection that is able to break immune tolerance in the gut. And then you need to be able to eat gluten. You need to be eating gluten in large amounts. And the result of these overlapping factors will be the development of celiac disease. So prevention is now developing a vaccine against Coxsackie B virus. And we have recently reported our first in human study where the vaccine was able to elicit high titers of viral neutralizing antibodies, durable titers without safety concerns in this particular study. 
So I just wanted to mention the vaccine as an example of primary prevention. This would be for healthy babies to try to remove one of the triggers and drivers, hypothetically, of course, because we haven't proven it yet, of celiac disease. But what happens to those who already have autoimmunity? Then we need secondary prevention or interception. We need to intercept the disease. And I always show this slide modified from Detlef Schuppen, just to indicate that there are so many attempts now to intercept the disease and that we will be able to combine some of these approaches and eventually meaningfully help people with celiac disease. So very, very quickly, there are experimental approaches to try to modify gluten before we consume it or to change the microbiome in order to influence the immune system. There are attempts to uh, prevent the leaky gut or in increased intestinal permeability that Alessio described. And it's, it's sad uh, for me and for the field that you don't see here anymore laracetide acetate because the phase three trial was uh, terminated. But as Dan mentioned, what we have learned with the laracetide assay uh, trials is invaluable. We learned how to do trials. We learned how to interpret trials. And it's just, just an essential step in the advancement of this field. There are two other companies now with products trying to prevent intestinal permeability from being increased. Once gluten gets through the gut wall, it's modified by transglutaminase. And as you all know, there are very interesting approaches to prevent the deamidation of gluten by transglutaminase. Uh, this was spearheaded by Chetan Koshla and uh, Detlef Schupan. So both Sedira and Sitari are now in clinical trials and you've probably seen the beautiful uh, New England Journal article on the phase 2A trial by Sedira. Gluten, once the amidate is able to trigger an adaptive immune response that is driven by lymphocytes, T lymphocytes that activate B cells and they produce antibodies. So as Dan beautifully explained, we have now a number of immune tolerance approaches led by Takeda with TAC101 and other companies, Anokion and others that are either in clinical stage, those are the ones indicated in green or preclinical stage in animal studies in blue. In addition to the adaptive immune response and also a uh, Janssen is trying to uh, downregulate these lymphocytes as well with gazelkimab. There is a second aspect of the immune response called the innate immune response. This is driven by intraepithelial lymphocytes, which are able to attack and destroy the epithelial cells of the gut without the need for specific antigen recognition. Um, they are driven by interleukin 15, and there are a number of attempts to uh, block interleukin-15, including my company, Prevention, as well as Calypso. And then finally, you're all familiar with attempts to destroy gluten inside the gut wall before it crosses the gut wall and stimulates interleukin-15 production and the adaptive immunity. And those approaches are led both by Takeda with TAC062, that was Kumamax, the glutenase, as well as Latic glutenase, which this was the original Chetan Koshla alvine enzyme currently under development by immunogenics and now in phase two. So a lot of promise, a lot of um, hope coming from hundreds of people. And again, as Dan mentioned, we need volunteers because all of these trials require hundreds of volunteers. And without your brave participation, we cannot advance and provide solutions for, for participants as well as the rest of the celiac community. 
And now to finalize my presentation, just very quickly, a few words about our drug, our inhibitor of interleukin-15. And currently is the most advanced product in development for celiac disease. It's in phase 2b. It blocks both the innate immunity, the intrapathelial lymphocytes, as well as adaptive immunity has a role in adaptive immunity as well, because interleukin-15 is able to stimulate adaptive immunity. And interleukin-15, it also has a big role in the development of refractory celiac disease with the presence of aberrant intrapathelial lymphocytes. For the sake of time, I'm not going to tell you about refractory celiac disease today, but we did conduct a clinical trial. Uh, this was Selimion and Amgen that showed the drug was effective and well tolerated in refractory celiac and is currently available from Amgen through a compassionate use program. Today, I will just briefly mention the results in non-responsive celiac disease. These are uh, celiac subjects who uh, don't have a malignant or aberrant lymphocytes. And this was published in uh, Lancet Gastroenterology Hepatology. This is the work uh, conducted by Mark Maki and his team in Finland. Um, a clinical trial with three arms, placebo, low dose, 150 milligrams and 300 milligrams, the high dose. It's an injection given every two weeks at home, like an insulin injection, subcutaneous. And this clinical trial had a, an initial period when patients were uh, provided placebo gluten. And we found that a number of patients, even though they were reportedly gluten-free, they were consuming gluten. This is the problem in, in non-responsive celiac. So these patients, what we call per protocol population two, were not provided gluten challenge. The rest of the patients were given a gluten challenge, which you can see here, characterized by looking at gluten in stool and urine. I was asked to mention that this test, in addition to be very helpful in clinical trials to monitor compliance with the diet, is available over the counter for patients to monitor the diet from glutenostics in the US, Biomedal X US. The test is called Gluten Detective, so glutendetective.com. So we um, looked at histology. The drug did not prevent the damage triggered by a high dose gluten challenge. This was a three gram per day for 10 weeks, very high amount of gluten. So this drug will not allow patients to eat a normal diet. However, it did show a trend towards improvement in histology in the absence of the gluten challenge. This is with just the gluten that patients were eating in their supposedly gluten-free diets. And the drug was also able to reduce significantly the intrapithelial lymphocytes as counted by um, Jorma Isola in Finland. It was able to reduce the decline in weight that is triggered by the gluten challenge. And especially it was quite efficacious at preventing the increase in symptoms that was triggered by the gluten challenge as measured by the celiac disease PRO, the patient reported outcome, the celiac disease GSRS, gastrointestinal symptom rating scale, and the Bristol stool, stool form scale, which is an, a measure of diarrhea. And you can see how, for example, here in blue, the placebo group had increased while the active groups, both the low dose and high dose, had reduced diarrhea. The physicians conducting this trial evaluated the patients and provided their opinion that the patients in the high dose group had significantly improved disease activity. So it was very promising. And given that the safety profile was uh, quite well tolerated with only some uh, injection side reactions at the site of the injections, this drug was moved forward into the phase 2B trial that we're currently conducting called PROACTIVE. It's a, a 220 patient trial. We expect results next year and we still need a lot of volunteers. So please, if you are considering volunteering 
This trial does not require a gluten challenge. You can maintain your standard gluten-free diet and you will be evaluated uh, for a period of six months at uh, great centers uh, around the US in Canada, as well as Spain and the Netherlands. So um, I will conclude, conclude here just by thanking all the volunteers in clinical trials because you're the true heroes of celiac research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Again, another pearl of uh, wisdom that we heard for somebody that is on the forefront of research to see a disease. Thank you so much. There are already popping up a lot of question and answer for you guys. So let's move to our last, um, but definitely not least, uh, speaker, Jocelyn Sylvester. You know, um, for those of us who have been in the field for a while, it's been always a struggle to make sure that, you know, um, the field will move forward even when we will retire. And Jocelyn is the classical example of individual that make me sleeping tight at night because it's one of the many racing stars that committed their career to see the disease. She's an MD, PhD, assistant professor, pediatric Harvard Medical School and director of research for the Celiac Disease Program at Children's uh, Hospital in Boston. Uh, she is also an associate staff at Beth Israel um, and maintains general pediatric practice in the northern Manitoba, her, you know, home mother. Uh, she just, you know, in a very, you know, young career, she already accomplished a lot. Uh, she's a co-chair of the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, CD Disease Special Interest Group and serves as the American Gastroenterology Association Council on the section for basic clinical and intestinal disorders. Uh, her focus of research is very translational and include the diagnosis and management of CD disease with a focus on what happened after the diagnosis CD disease made. She's a co-investigator of the Manitoba CD disease court study involved in clinical trials for alternative therapies to a gluten-free diet and is leading the consortium of pediatric CEDIC centers across the United States to develop tools to improve follow-up care, particularly in the pediatric population. So without any further ado, Jocelyn, again, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessio, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I, I am the youngest speaker and the, most, the least experienced, so it's nice to follow two uh, really leaders in this field. And what I wanted to do was answer one of the questions that I guess get asked a lot, and in so doing, um, sort of take down the curtain a little bit and let you know a little bit about what goes into actually designing and thinking about those studies that you just learned about, which will help understand why we ask you to do what you do when we are wanting to enroll you for a clinical trial for a drug. So it's a little bit inside out. Um, and I think the most important disclaimer up front is that most studies are not clinical trials and most studies for celiac disease do not involve any gluten. So this is really a special case scenario, which as has already been mentioned is more topical right now for celiac disease because for the first time ever, we have lots of drugs that we're testing. And so why are we asking you to eat gluten when ever since diagnosis, we've been telling you not to eat gluten. And so I'll start off with some disclosures. Um, and uh, this is a summary. So we'll start off talking about traditional trials and then a little bit about what makes celiac disease different and then the role of gluten. So traditionally, if you think about a clinical trial, which can be for a drug or a device, usually you're starting with people who are sick and you're doing some sort of intervention and you're trying to see if they get better. And so the first stage is something called screening because not all sick patients are the same. And so within that population of people with celiac disease, it might be that you particularly want people who have a biopsy confirmed diagnosis or a certain age group, or as you just saw for the prevention study, people who are still having symptoms. So you need to meet these inclusion criteria to be somebody who fits in the population. But then you might have those characteristics and have some other characteristics that aren't wanted. Um, for instance, you might be on immunosuppressive drugs, which aren't great for testing and immunotherapy. You may have an allergy to something that's in a gluten challenge. Um, or there might be requirements for your belly to be a certain height or not so high. Um, and so once people have been screened, that's when the actual trial starts. And at the beginning of the trial for drugs, particularly, there's two really important things that we do. The first one is randomization. So when you sign up for a trial, you don't know if you're getting the drug or the placebo and the investigators probably don't know either. 
um, you'll be assigned to an arm, either drug or placebo usually. Um, and that's called blinding where you don't know. So typically you'll hear it's a double blind randomized control trial. So that double blind means that neither the investigator and the people who are on the study team or the person who's actually participating know what they're getting. And the philosophy behind this is that means that uh, judgments about whether people have symptoms and what's happening are going to be more objective because we're not going to be biased by what we think about the drug or the placebo. Single blind is when only the participant knows, and triple blind is when the people who are analyzing the data don't even know until they get the result. So patients get randomized and assigned to an arm, and in traditional clinical trials, usually there's a drug and there's a placebo, and then there's something called an endpoint, which is what we're measuring as a measure of whether or not this drug is working, what do we actually want it to do. It can be symptoms, it could be histology, it could be quality of life. Here's an example um, from uh, Dr. Leffler's talk. Um, and there's really two types of endpoints. And the ones we spend a lot of time talking about when we talk about drugs are the primary endpoints, which is really, did this drug do what we think it did? Should we invest to take it on to the next stage? What's actually more important and maybe more exciting is the secondary endpoints. And so these are the other things that we put into the trial in order to learn about the disease. And as Dr. Leffler said, a good trial should not only teach us about the drug, but we should also learn important things about the disease because that's really how we move the field forward. And so that's part of the reason why when you come, you will be asked lots of questions. You'll be asked for lots of samples. There will be lots of points of contact because we're trying to answer not just whether the drug works, but other important questions. Um, and then at the end, we see whether people got better or not. So this is a traditional clinical trial, um, taking sick people, randomizing them to drug or placebo, checking to see if they got better. Celiac disease is a little bit unique for many reasons. Um, first of all, there's no drug, which means we've never done this before. So there's no precedent and there's no roadmap of where to go. Also, most patients who have the diagnosis are on a gluten-free diet and understandably reluctant to go off a gluten-free diet. Um, and there is also high variability in what a gluten-free diet actually is. So this is an example from our doggy bag study where we asked participants who've been on a gluten-free diet for two years to collect stool, urine, and food samples for us. And then we measured them for gluten. And what you can see on the top are the control patients on an unrestricted diet. So they had lots of gluten in every type of sample. And then we had 12 of our 18 celiac patients who had positive samples. And what you can see is that it's almost like just shooting bullets at the screen. It's somewhat random. And yes, some people have more than others. And we don't necessarily know where different people fit in when we put them in a, in a clinical trial. So are you one of the people who has no gluten, who's not on this, or are you this person who's having gluten quite frequently? And that obviously could affect how you respond to the drug. Um, the other thing that's unique is that most patients will tell us that they don't have a lot of celiac disease related symptoms, which means that we can't pull these symptomatic people. So instead of taking this scenario where we have sick people and we're trying to make them better, in celiac disease, we're taking healthy people and we're trying to see if a drug works, but we don't really design drugs for healthy people. And usually we get people to continue on their baseline gluten-free diet, however gluten-free it is. So it's the same. We have screening, we have randomization, there's a drug or placebo arm, and then we need an endpoint. But if the patient's on a gluten-free diet and your drug is related to what happens when they eat gluten, what can your endpoint be if there's no gluten? And so this is why most clinical trials for drugs include gluten, because this way we can see what the effects are with gluten and without gluten and whether or not it's an effect on gluten that we can infer is making the difference for our patients. Trials where there is no gluten are typically trials that are looking for symptomatic patients because then your measure isn't whether or not they're better than the placebo group, but whether or not they got better compared to their own symptoms. So this allows us to have an endpoint, and now we can do our clinical trial for celiac disease, and we can put gluten in on top of a regular gluten-free diet. Now, many people feel that they have symptoms and are anxious about having gluten, and that can cause symptoms as well. And so often there will be another arm, um, which is a placebo gluten arm. So 
This allows to correct not only for the effects of whether or not there's gluten in the diet, but also the effects of people being worried that they're having symptoms because they might get. And so you saw several designs where there was multiple arms. There may be more arms if there's multiple um, doses of the drug, which is also common. So um, this is our traditional design, which is again, very different, a little bit more simple. And we're, we're kind of going backwards in celiac disease. And how do we do it go backwards? We go backwards with gluten, but how much gluten do you actually need? And you saw, we all had disclosures about advisory boards. This is something I think that is talked about a lot because in designing a trial, there's a balance. We want a good trial that's really gonna give us something we can learn about the drug, but we want to have the least burden and the least harm to patients. And so it's really important to pick a dose of gluten that's high enough, but not too high. Sort of the baby bear, just right dose of gluten. Um, and we're learning as we go along, because remember, there's no roadmap. So part of it has it relates to what the drug does, and part of it relates to what the indication is for the drug. So if you think about a drug that is an enzyme to present symptoms of intermittent gluten exposure on a gluten-free diet, this is what we see on these people who we saw before who were on a gluten-free diet. And so we need to sprinkle in small amounts of gluten inter inter intermittently in order to simulate that phenomenon. So um, often these trials involve eating something that may or may not contain gluten that may or may not look like a food um, at prescribed intervals. And then we can see the difference between the people who got gluten and the ones who did. Um, the other thing is maybe it's an alternative to gluten-free diet. Maybe this is gonna change how the immune system responds. In that case, you need lots of gluten because you're trying to simulate what happens when people with celiac disease are eating an unrestricted diet. And so the dose is really related to um, what the intent of the drug is um, and what the, what the target population for the trial is. So I think this has been covered, but it's important, which is why I wanted to mention it again, which is that we don't learn anything without volunteers who help us to do these experiments and find out what's happening. And even when drugs quote fail, we often learn a lot and it's advancing the field forward. So the important thing is volunteering. We also design these studies so, so that there may be a checkpoint in the middle. So if it doesn't look like it's working, we can stop the study and not have more volunteers when it's futile. So um, this is the examples that we saw of um, interleukin-2 from the NEXVAC study. Um, and then this is the, um, the data uh, looking at the um, capsule endoscopy. And this is something I actually mentioned in clinic a lot, which is why I wanted to put it up because what we see here is the participants before gluten, they really didn't have a lot of uh, damage. They had that nice forest of villi. After 14 days of a relatively high dose gluten challenge every day, they start to have a lot of damage. Those villi are starting to get chopped down. When we take them off the of gluten and we look 28 days later, most of them are looking pretty good. And so this actually gives us some data on what happens if you've been on a gluten-free diet for a long time and you're healthy and you accidentally get the wrong bowl of pasta or somebody tells you something has, is gluten-free and it's not. And so this is an example of how in learning about treatments, we can also learn useful data about the disease itself. Now, the most common question I get after why would I want to eat gluten is, Will I get to eat a croissant, a bagel, a Cheez-It, something that has gluten in it that's a food? And I think this is one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about that I think we're starting to get a little bit more sophisticated about, but it's hard because gluten is, is not a thing in the same way that a drug or um, other foods are a thing. So um, when we are doing research studies, we often like to be very precise which is why gluten is in a slurry or gluten is in tablets or gluten is a powder. When somebody with celiac disease is eating gluten every day and it may be making them sick, they want something that's worth it. And so that's usually food. And so I think this is a work in progress. And the reason that we are picking things that may be less palatable are because it's easier to control and know what it is. And sometimes 
actually how it moves from your stomach matters. So when you're thinking about IL-2, where it's a four hour measurement, if you have something that's gonna take two hours to get to the duodenum, then that may not be as helpful as something that's a slurry that's gonna get there more quickly. So the gluten intervention is targeted, not just in the dose and the duration and the amount, but also in the format. So um, why um, do this? I think it's the way we're going to learn. We've demonstrated that damage is reversible, which is why we, it's ethical to do these studies. Um, the selection process is designed to make sure that if there's something about the study that may make you particularly high risk, that that's an exclusion criteria. Um, and the amount varies. Um, and sometimes there's options to change the amount of gluten in the study. So if you're interested, the thing to do is to ask. Um, and remember that you may also learn something about yourself from these studies, because if we're doing follow-up biopsies and we try and have permission, we can share the results with you. It's interesting just to learn how um, research works. Um, and you're really doing something that is tremendous, not just for yourself, but for everybody with celiac disease. So finally, how do you find out about studies and where do you sign up? Um, the, the, for people who are in North America, um, most studies are registered on clinicaltrials.gov before they recruit their first patient. So you can go to this website and you can type in celiac disease and you can see different studies, including some that you saw mentioned today, and it'll have a section where you can see which sites are doing them. You can ask your doctor. There's research volunteer registries. Um, you can reach out to people. Um, many sites actually maintain lists of people who are interested in studies so that when a new study comes up, those are the first people who get invited. So ask and don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, and remember that even if you don't qualify, there may be something that you don't see on clinicaltrials.gov that you may be able to participate in. Um, and you don't know if you don't try. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Perfect, thank you so much. You know, uh, all the three of you guys have done an unbelievable job. We have a ton of questions that we received beforehand. The one that we received question and answer, some of them have been addressed before. So let's go through this a quick question, a quick answer, if you allow me to. The first question is for, you know, uh, Francisco. How do, um, how do people who don't live close to a research site participate? And is that possible to have a list of, uh, you know, center or physician participating in clinical trials available? Yeah, so each trial will be listed in a government website called clinicaltrials.gov. And this link uh, will take you to a page when, where you can see the cities and oftentimes even the, the physicians conducting the study. And there will always be a contact person that you can connect with to learn about specific sites. Oftentimes, trials also have a specific website dedicated that will allow you to find out about the study. I did paste the links to the proactive trial for these two ways to learn about the trial in, in the chat. And um, always the trials compensate for travel. They can compensate more or less. Some, some trials will cover um, being picked up by a, by a car and being paid for a hotel stay next to the clinical site if necessary. So um, please don't hesitate to ask because companies are very interested in facilitating as much as possible and reduce the burden. Thank you. The next is from Dan. Um, I would love to participate in clinical trial, but the doctor who diagnosed me uh, so via a blood test that suggests against a biopsy confirmation. It's worth eating gluten again for six plus weeks and getting a biopsy so that I can participate. Yeah, so, you know, this is something that has become more and more of an issue over the last couple of years as more people are getting di diagnosed without a biopsy, either during COVID or because of their following European guidelines. I think, again, that it's, it's sort of going to sound like a little bit of a broken record, but it's trial specific. And some trials will actually have you know, 
diagnostic confirmation is part of the initial steps in the trial. Some trials are actually fine with people who are serologically diagnosed without a biopsy. So, you know, I, I think that if, if you're interested in research, regardless, if you have any positive data, whether serology or biopsy or both, ideally, but one or the other, feel free to reach out to the site, to the, <coughs> to the study or the research associate, and they'll be able to walk you through. And again, even if the, the trial you looked at, you are not able to participate in, they may have an option B that might be a better fit. Thank you. Jocelyn, next is for you. How much gluten needs to be consumed for participating in a clinical trial? Does the amount vary? If so, will a drug be specific to consume a certain amount of gluten? So that's a great question, and it does vary. So the studies you've seen presented here today, some there's none, some there's, you know, equivalent to eating several meals a day with gluten. Um, and so it, it depends really on what the drug is for. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's important just to reach out and ask. Um, when we have people who volunteer, we keep a list. And one of the questions we ask is, would you be willing to eat gluten? So if not, we won't bother you about studies that involve eating gluten. But um, if so, then we will um, offer those to you. So I think, remember that there's a lot of variety. Um, and by asking, you may learn about a lot, a lot more than what you initially asked about. Thank you. The next again is for them. Are any enzymes approved already to help someone with CD digest gluten? Yeah, unfortunately not. This has been a, a, a promising modality for a long time. It makes so much sense, right? It's almost like a lactate for celiac disease, but it, it turns out that gluten is a lot harder to digest than lactose. And, you know, getting a formulation and drug right that works effectively in the stomach has been a little harder than I think some of us initially had hoped. So there's, there are things over the counter, they have not been rigorously tested, um, there are other, but there's nothing approved. And, uh, you know, however, there is ongoing clinical trials of both the one I'm working on, TACO-62, and um, another one, Latagglutinase, both of which um, in different ways have shown some degree of promise, but are not yet approved or available outside of clinical trials. Wonderful. Okay, and the next one is for Francisco. What is the um, what is in the drug development pipeline? Anything that will allow someone with CD to safely consume gluten? You you gave an overview, and this is a little bit repetitive, but you know, just you know, you want to reiterate. Well, um, I think probably the the pathways that offer most promise to allow people to eat gluten are some of what Dan described. Those that can induce immunological tolerance, um, but it's something that it remains to be proven, right? It's, it's going to take still many years for, for those um, new candidates to be tested. So unfortunately, the, the majority of the programs now under development are trying to help celiac patients who, despite being on a gluten-free diet, continue to have symptoms. And that's what we call non-responsive celiac disease because there's not a good response to the diet. Those, the drugs are trying to make those people healthy while on a gluten-free diet, but healthy because the problem is today, half of all celiac patients on a gluten-free diet continue to have disease activity. And that is what's not really acceptable. Dan, do you want to add anything or Jocelyn? No, I, I think you covered it. I think it's yeah. also, it's, it, it's hard to feel confident when you're just starting in developing drugs for celiac disease that this drug can go without a gluten-free diet. So I think a gluten-free diet is something that's also a safety measure in clinical trials, um, which again gets to this whole idea of how can we learn the most with the least burden on the people who are participating. Actually, the next question is a sequel of this, and Jocelyn, uh, somebody wants to know, do you really think that a real cure or treatment other than a following strict gluten-free diet for life would be found and available to patients anytime soon? Would be a pill? Will be a vaccine. I, soon is soon is a very vague term. Um, I would love to think in my lifetime, um, and uh, but I don't see <coughs> a timeline for that. And we have to remember that uh, most drugs fail 
And so that's why we need lots of shots on target. And that's why there's lots of clinical trials. And the reason why we're excited because having one drug or two drugs is great, but in order to really get something through the finish line, we probably need dozens of drugs. So then does a vaccine for celiac disease only works if you have not yet developed celiac disease? What about if you have already diagnosed? Yeah, so I think there's two different potential, you know, useful therapies. One is something like what Francisco's working on that moving their uh, ability to get some of the viral triggers. So I think there is a different class of therapies either using traditional vaccines or microbiome approaches that could prevent celiac disease. Um, alternatively, there are sort of immune tolerizing therapies that are specifically for people who've already developed celiac disease and you're trying to turn off the immune reaction. And, you know, I think in, in an ideal world, I think we'll have some of both of those uh, uh, options for patients. Obviously, prevention is better than cure, um, but, but both, but, you know, we're never going to catch everyone before they develop celiac disease. So I think a, a holistic approach would have some of both. Okay. Uh, so, um, Francisco, are there clinical trials specifically for people with celiac disease and the age? Not to my knowledge, but DH is not excluded from many clinical trials. What I mean is you can have DH, dermatitis herpetiformis, and celiac and participate in a celiac trial and then assess if you improve of one, both, or none of those conditions. Gotcha. Um, Jocelyn, if I sign up for a clinical trial, am I automatically in? Or could I be rejected from my study? If so, what are reasons someone couldn't participate? That's a great question. And that's why I talked a little bit about this whole process called screening. So we have several clinical trials ongoing right now. If you call us and say you're interested, we'll start asking you questions to make sure you're the type of person we need. Maybe you have to be on a gluten-free diet for a certain period of time. Maybe there's certain symptoms. And then we'll make sure that you don't have any of the things that we what we know won't work in the trial. And so usually that starts with a phone call. Often there's additional visits because we want, may want to do some blood work and check serology, or as Dr. Leffler was saying, there may be some confirmatory diagnostics that we want to do to make sure we have the right population. Um, and so usually there's interaction and participation in the study for screening before actually getting to that point of randomization and being randomized to either drug or placebo. We have two minutes, two quick questions, two quick answers. The first one is for Dan. I was diagnosed less than a year ago and my antibody levels have not yet normalized. Is this a problem for joining drug study? Not necessarily. Uh, uh, different studies will have different amounts of time. You have to be on the diet before you can join and different studies have requirements for low antibody levels or high antibody levels, or, or at least uh, could take it either way. So again, nothing from that that it would preclude you from a lot of clinical trials. I can so worth and, uh, Thank you, Francisco. Are there trials for refractory celiac disease? There have been. Uh, I don't think there's any at the moment, um, but you can always try to get drug through this compassionate use program I mentioned from Amgen for the IL-15 drug. Um, and the list of all clinical trials available is always updated in the, the websites of groups like National Celiac Association and others. So please check with them for, for new potential studies. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank the three speakers for engaging, uh, you know, talks that I gave for very inquisitive questions that we received from the audience and the appropriate answer that we received. And I'm going to pass back to Lee for closing uh, remarks. Thank you, everybody. Yes, again, thank you, everybody. We hope you found this webinar as, as interesting as I did. Um, I've been around with celiac disease for a while, but boy, I learn something every time we have one of these webinars. Uh, we'll be hosting again another webinar in November, and we hope you'll uh, join us at that time. Please check the National Celiac website, nationalceliac.org, for further information. And until then, from all of us here, see you next time and stay well.